Hey YouTube, welcome to the next episode on the binome expansion. Today, we're going to look at how the last episode of Pascal's triangle relates to factorial notation, which then leads on to the binomial expansion. So let's get right to it. Now, what is factorial notation? As you can see in the highlighted box, n factorial, so the exclamation mark represents a factorial, is you take the number, and in this case, it'd be an integer, n factorial, so n is an integer, and you multiply it by all of the integers that precede that number. So for example, five factorial would be five times four times three times two times one, and it ends at one. Now in statistics, n factorial refers to the number of combinations of arranging n objects. And we particularly like to use this in the binomial distribution. So anyone who's done a bit of statistics can see the link in the name, the binomial distribution in statistics and the binomial expansion in pure maths. So check this example. How many unique ways are there of arranging three colored circles? So we've got purple, green, and orange. Now, if we were to list them, this is what we would do at GCSE. We have purple, green, and orange. Then we can switch the last two. It would be P, O, G. Then we can change the beginning number. We can start with G, P, and then O. Then we can rearrange the last two again, G, O, P, to this six. But generally in statistics and pure maths, we're not actually interested in what the combinations are. We just care about how many they are. If we look at what I wrote above, n factorial refers to the number of combinations of arranging n objects. Now here we have three objects. So that must mean that the total number of arranging them is three factorial. Now what is three factorial? Remember we take the integer and we multiply it by all the integers that precede that up until one. So it'll be three times two times one, which gives us six. So this is the quick way of doing it. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're new here and you want more maths content, then please consider subscribing. If you're learning something, then hit that like button and comment down below to let me know what you wanna learn next. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. What happens when some of the objects are not unique? So. How many unique ways are there of arranging four purple and three green circles? Well, the first thing we do is we state how many combinations would there be if the objects were unique. Now there's seven objects, right? So if they were unique, it would be seven factorial. So I'm just gonna make a note, this would be if they were unique. But now we have to take into account that there are four purples that are not unique, and three greens that are not unique. What we have to think about is how many combinations are there of arranging the purple objects which do not change the sequence. Now, there's four purple objects. If we arrange, rearrange those four objects within themselves, it doesn't actually change the combination. So we have to ask ourselves, how many different ways are there of arranging those four purple objects. Well, there must be four factorial ways of arranging those four objects. Yeah, so we're kind of thinking about them as being unique within themselves to think about how we arrange them. But, well, that le leads us to concluding that there's four factorial different ways of arranging them within themselves. Now we need to remove that from that seven factorial. Yeah, we wanna get rid of those combinations. Now remember, seven factorial is a multiplication. So to get rid of combinations, we need to do a division. We need to divide by four factorial. So this is the non-unique purple combinations. And now we have to do the same with the greens. How many different ways are there of arranging those three green objects, which do, does not change the sequence. Well, similar to the purple, there must be three factorial ways of rearranging those three green objects. So we need to get rid of three factorial non-unique green combos. So this is the non-unique green combos. And between the two, it's just a multiplication. So we can simplify. So I'm going to do this explicitly without using a calculator. 
Now you might notice on the top and the bottom, you have similar combinations. 4, 3, 2, 1. 4, 3, 2, 1. You can also say 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. This will just cancel out the 6. And then you're left with 7 times 5 on the top, 35. There is only 35 ways of arranging 4 purple and 3 green circles, and we don't need to list them. So what's the point of all this? Now, we have a way of representing what I've just done. We use n choose r. Now, if you look below, we, re we read this as n choose r, or how many unique combinations of arranging r objects out of n. So in terms of the previous example, on the numerator, we had seven factorial, right? So it was seven objects. And we were asking, how many different ways are there of arranging four purple out of seven objects in total? So here you have the, we had four objects in total. And what that means is this last factorial here, if you know how many objects there are in total, and how many there are of one type, you immediately know how many of the other type there are by just subtracting. So when we had seven factorial over four factorial purple, we immediately knew how many of the other type there were. There was three, because you just do seven minus four. Now in terms of n choose r, n in this case is seven. We have seven objects. Choose r is four. Now just another note, four factorial and three factorial, because it's multiplication, the three and the four could have been written the other way, which is actually another point I'll describe a bit later, is seven choose four is actually the same as seven choose three, yeah? Because I could have written seven factorial over four factorial, three factorial is seven factorial over three factorial, four factorial. Now, how does this link to the binomial expansion? Remember, Pascal's triangle from last lesson? Well, each item in Pascal's triangle can be written in the form of n choose r, depending on its row and column. This is incredibly useful since we now do not need to construct the triangle anymore. And we don't even need to remember what is in each row because the calculator can compute this for us. So if you look at the zeroth row, so we have zero, choose zero. So this top number tells you which row you're in and the bottom number tells you what column you're in. So if we were to look at, for example, this three, that three is in the third row, because we don't count the, the zeroth row. So it's in the third row, and it's in the first column. Because the, the triangle has all ones, the first set of ones, we just say it's in the zeroth position, yeah? So that three, if we look over, is in the third row in the first column, yeah? So the first number we always say is the zeroth column, just like how the, the technically first row is actually the zeroth row, yeah? Very useful. So we do not need to know what these terms are. So that six, we know it's in the fourth row and in the second position. So here we go, fourth row, second position. And I'll show you how we type this in the calculator. So this takes us to the binomial expansion. And this is really useful for when we deal with powers that are quite large. And also, to be honest, because we just don't want to remember what the triangle is. So find the first four terms in the following expansions in ascending powers of x or 2 plus t cubed to the power of 8. So in the last episode, what we did was is we would write Pascal's triangle all the way to the eighth row. And those were the coefficients. And remember, one of the terms goes up in power, one of the terms goes down in power. But here they only want the first four terms. Remember, the first choosing notation starts with zero. So we have the eighth row, so they all will start with eight, choose the zeroth position, that'll be one of the coefficients. Then we would have eight choose one. This is me going along the eighth row. If we go back, you see as we go along, it's choose zero, choose one, choose two, choose three, choose four, yeah? And also remember with Pascal's triangle, there's symmetry, right? One, one, four, four, and then the six is in the middle. This goes back to what I was saying before in terms of four choose one is the exact same as four choose three. In the same way, seven choose four is the same as seven choose three due to the symmetry of the seventh line. Now, what are these numbers? 
So eight choose zero will be one. Eight choose one, I'm gonna show you in the calculator in a second, but eight choose one is always eight. The first two computations are actually quite easy. But in your calculator, you would press eight, then shift, then the divide button has that choose button, and then we would put two. So we have 28, then eight choose three, just go back, change it to three. 56, and these form the coefficients of our binomial expansion. Then remember the first term is going to go down in power. So it's gonna go two to the power of eight, two to the power of seven, and then it just keeps going, but it's not interested, it only wants the first four terms, right? Then the t cubed will start from zero and it will work its way up. Power one, power two, power three. And we put pluses in the middle. And you can put plus dot 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 just to indicate that it's going to keep going, but we're not interested in those. Remember the, the trick I told you to look out for? The powers need to add to 8. 8 plus 0 is 8. 7 plus 1 is 8. 6 plus 2 is 8. 5 plus 3 is 8. This is just a double check so that you, to make sure that you don't make a mistake. We just need to compute. And then the last term, we have 56, 2 to the power of 5. Now remember, when we're doing t cubed cubed, we are multiplying the powers. Yeah, using our index rules. So it'll be t to the power of nine, plus dot dot dot. And that is our solution. Final question, find the term independent of y in this expansion to the power of six. So the first thing we wanna do is we want to find the coefficients. So we're gonna have another benefit of your knowledge now is that you know their symmetry. So the first term and the last term are the same. Six choose one would be six. This would be six. So when we write it, so we're gonna have one, then I'm gonna start doing the brackets now. So one over y is gonna go down in power. Y squared is gonna go up in power. Okay, so once we've done the full expansion, without having to simplify everything, you just need to look out for which terms would the y's cancel out. Now, for example, say we take the middle term, usually students go straight to the middle term. If we were to simplify that, we get one over y cubed times y squared cubed, which we multiply them together. Now they would not cancel out. So you need to look along and think which ones would actually cancel. And you should notice that it's this term because you'd have one over y to the power of four times y to the power of four, and they would cancel. So the term that is independent of y is the third term here, which is 15. So the term is 15, which is the third term. And in this case, it'd be in ascending powers of y, we're going up. So the first term here is y to the power of minus six. If you look on the other side, it's y to the power of, uh, y to the power of 12. So which is the third term in the series in ascending powers of x. So this is us just being thorough in terms of our description. So that's it guys. This is how we link factorial notation to the binomial expansion. It makes life a lot easier. In the next episode, I'm gonna do some trickier examples and eventually we're gonna move into some exam questions as well. So if you learned something, please hit that like button and make sure you subscribe for more maths content. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace. Run!